<laughs> okay, so um, a, a little bit about myself. Um, I have my own energy healing practice of reconnected healing here in the Washington DC area. And um, uh, Ellen and I, Oh, oh, <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna give you guys um, a little background of how Ellen and I met. Um, uh, we're both going to share with you today our stories. I'm gonna go ahead and share first and uh, then Ellen will share and then we'll open for questions. So um, here we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> When I was uh, seven years old, I was at Girl Scout camp and uh, I was doing a really crazy new dive, a backwards dive off the diving board. And, uh, you know, I, I got up on the diving board, I walked out to the edge and as I started to bend over, my feet slipped out from under me and uh, my, the top of my head, I have a big scar up there, the top of my head hit the diving board and I plummeted to the bottom of this pond. And the next thing I knew, I was about uh, 20 feet away from myself. I was outside of my body and I could see, it wasn't like I knew, I didn't know that that image was me. It was like, I, look, I looked at myself from outside of my body and I really, you know, I felt this sort of connection uh, as I was observing this beautiful little seven-year-old I had my nice new red uh, swimming suit on. I don't know if you guys remember, but the suits used to have those little daisy skirts around them. And I was sitting, <laughs> I was sitting in a cross-legged Buddha position. And you know, the bottom of the pond, I could sort of still feel it was slimy. And I could see in the distance this little girl sitting there in her little, like a little flower <laughs> on the bottom of the pond. And I just felt this over overwhelming love for her and this sense that I knew that even if she was struggling everything was just going to work out for her it was just going to be a beautiful unfolding and I thought to myself oh she's just so beautiful I could just beat her up you know <laughs> and then the next thing I knew um, I sort of heard or knew a voice was knowing to me you need to push up now, <laughs> you know, you need, like, you need to push up, you need air. And so in that moment, I was magnetized right back into my body and I could feel my toes and the squishy silt as I sort of gently pushed off and I emerged right near the dock where I uh, dived off of. And uh, I swam to the ladder and back then we had the swim, you had to wear swim cap, the caps, it was mandatory. I swam to the ladder and I thought, oh, I hope nobody saw me hit my head. I was very embarrassed and I climbed up the ladder and I looked around <laughs> and then I heard some screaming <laughs> from the line that was, <laughs> and it was because blood was coming out of my cap. I must have looked like a, a Halloween horror movie <laughs> for those poor kids. And uh, at that time, I turned around and I could see the canoe coming. And uh, these two girls were paddling really fast and they took me back and I had my uh, head uh, put together, put back together with a butterfly band. They said a little bald spot and then they closed it back together. Uh, but after that, I had these sort of incredible ex experiences as a child, spiritual experiences. Um, uh, for example, in church, uh, I don't know if anyone's Catholic, but we do the Stations of the Cross just about this time of the year, and it's all about suffering. And uh, we were there in the church, our second grade uh, Catholicism class, and uh, we were being instructed on the suffering part <laughs> of the story. And the next thing I knew, I was up out of my body again, and I was floating, sort of hovering over the second graders. And this sort of presence that I knew as uh, Jesus, <laughs> that's the only name I have for that energy. It was just loving. And he came to me and he took my cheeks and he turned me to the other side of the church. And I was magnetized over to where Mary has her altar. And Mary's altar is 
fun. It has flowers and it smells good. <laughs> and I could feel this overwhelming love, you know, and he was knowing to me, it's not about the pain and suffering. It's about the love. So I was starting to have like those kind of interesting experiences. And I always felt um, sort of a deep sense of peace where, um, I don't know, for me, it was, it was just a place I could go, whether it was into the forest or praying in the church. I always felt a deep sense of peace. Well, fast forward you know, to my early uh, 20s, my late 20s, I was 29 when I was cycling down Pacific Coast Highway. I had a great job just outside of LA. I was headed down to Laguna Beach and um, working crazy hours and also racing as a professional triathlete on the weekends. Um, I was uh, under a lot of stress. You know, I kind of lost that connection with that piece. I didn't, I didn't remember that in my childhood. You know, I was, I'd gotten into adulthood and um, that faded. Uh, and I was starting to feel sort of overwhelmed. But that day it was a beautiful blue day. Um, I was headed to my favorite surfing spot. And the next thing I knew, I was out of my body and I could see below me a bike and, and then my body and then a car. And um, I noticed all these people were gathering and they were talking and they were gathered in the circle and chatting amongst themselves. Uh, and I, was sort, I sort of was magnetized over there. I was listening to them, but it was interesting. It was like groups of thoughts. And there were three groups. The first group was, don't touch her, we'll get sued. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like uh, we're a very litigi litigious society in a way. And uh, the other one was, wow, a dead person. You know, that was the next group thought. And then the third group thought was, whoa, I wonder what's gonna happen. <laughs> you know, they had never seen a dead person. And they were just sort of like, they wanted to, again, they wanted to help. But I listened to that for a little while. I just sort of not, wasn't very interesting because over to my right side was this um, magnetizing light. And it just started to get brighter and brighter. And as I turned toward it, I, it was like I was accelerated into it. And in that moment, everything, my boundary conditions as a human being were gone. And I could feel myself and I could feel myself in the water molecules. I could hear myself in the wind. I could see every detail on earth. I could feel this vibration and knowingness that permeated me. Like if I had any doubts about why I came into this life or the big picture about how things work, I didn't, I couldn't even form that question about why, you know, what is going on before all the answers were just there instantaneously available to me. I didn't even need to ask the question anymore. I couldn't formulate it fast enough to absorb all the information that was coming. And it was coming and it was, there was with that immense joy and peace, that peace I had felt as a young child, it was enormous. And I sat there and I thought I could be here forever. And then the next thing I knew, I heard a voice know or say to me, um, well, what you can stay here. It's you have a choice, you can stay. But what about your mother and your grandmother? And in that instant, I started like headed toward a tornado. I went, the, I took the tunnel the other way. <laughs> I took the tornado the other way. I could see in the very end, this, ambulance and I knew that my body was in there and I started I didn't go in like the first side I started I went all the way around the ambulance and came in the back side I don't know why but um I could see this guy was really he was anxious and he was working really hard to try to get me breathing and then I started to feel his whole life I could feel his his love for his wife. Um, I could see him making banana pancakes. He just made banana pancakes with his two daughters that morning. 
And then I could smell the banana pancakes. And the next thing I knew, I was back in my body. And he was like, whew, we almost lost you. You know, so um, I was like, yeah, wow. I mean, like I couldn't even get my head around what had happened. It happened so quickly. But over, over the uh, next almost year that followed, I would have technicolor dreams. It was almost as if the information that I had received about things I wanted to know I had, and they would unfold in these, these beautiful panaceas. Um, and, you know, life got busy again. And I wouldn't tell anybody about that at that time because I was in the military. And you don't necessarily talk about those things, or you didn't then. I think it's more it's easier to do that today. But uh, 30 years ago, not so much. Maybe it's 40. It's 40 years ago. Oh my God, I'm getting old. <laughs> 40 years ago, not so much. Just didn't talk about those things, or you could end up in a psych ward. Uh, so life got busy again. And then uh, I started to have that stress response, and I, and I really couldn't find my peace. And um, I picked up a book called The Reconnection, Heal Others, Heal Yourself. And I could feel that vibration, like the edge of what I had felt in my near-death experience. And I read it. And I couldn't stop reading it. And I went to the training. Uh, well, before I went to the training, I had a session. And in that, in that session, I had three sessions. Um, I had a, what you know is a kundalini awakening. And it was like all my chakras are aligned. And in those sessions, I could hear and feel the frequencies of home. I could hear and feel the sound and light that were in my near-death experience. It was familiar to me. It was as if I had returned home without dying. And um, so I was inspired to bring that to others. And in that inspiration, it led me to Ellen. And uh, Ellen came to my door one day and, and uh, she said, hey, I heard you're work working at Walter Reed. I was actually helping uh, with the Red Cross there doing some volunteer work. And um, she said, how'd you get in there? I'd like, to, I'd like to help too. And I said, well, I'm kind of working undercover, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, just because I was, you know, your presence carries, carries your vibration. And every one of us has that ability to influence each other, to raise each other up. And so I was over there and I could see that that was happening for them. And I said, well, you know, I'm working undercover just because I'm present. It happens naturally. And it's the same with everyone. You know, as you reach a different vibration, you help to bring others up. Um, so anyway, so Ellen said, uh, well, how'd you get into reconnective healing? I said, oh, I don't know. I found the book. And uh, she said, uh, I said, well, how did you find it? And she said, I had a near-death experience. And now I'm going to tell you, I had had two near-death experiences. And I had no name for it. I did not read books like that at that time. I was a telecom engineer. I was working for Verizon. And I had no idea what a near-death experience was. But when Ellen described it to me, I still didn't because I didn't like I thought you had to code or, you know, you had to be in a hospital. And she said, well, why don't you come to the IANS meeting? It's an international association for near death studies. And it was in Maryland at the time. And I said, OK. And uh, there was the presenter there and he was talking just like we're sharing with you today. He was sharing his near death experience. And um, he said, well, I had a choice. They told me, the angel told me I had a choice. But then she said, what about your mother? And he said, that's when I started going through the tunnel back to my body. <laughs> and in that moment, I knew that now that mystical spiritual experience now had a name. And not only that, it had a whole community of people who had had similar experiences and felt and experienced that light and love from the other side. And um, I'd like to introduce Ellen. She's one of my best friends, Ellen Dye. She's uh, just an awesome uh, companion for the work that we do. 
And Ellen, I can't say enough, but thank you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Jen, Jen and I figure we go way back. <laughs> many, <laughs> many lifetimes together. <laughs> oh, far back. <laughs> In a galaxy far, far away. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm Ellen Dye, and uh, not long ago I was given a presentation, and somebody said, Dye, did you change your name to that? <laughs> because you died. And, I'm, <laughs> and it had never occurred to me. How funny that was that my name is Ellen Dye and I had a near-death experience, but there you have it. You know, life, life has so many ironies and so many little jokes embedded in it. You know, <laughs> a lot of times we don't see them. Oh, um, Ellen, your first name means light, right? L. Yes, my first name means light. And um, so unlike Joan, who, who grew, you know, she, she's an engineer <laughs> and joined the military. I was all the, always this little woo-woo <laughs> child. <laughs> I've since come to, come to believe that I had a near-death ex, um, experience as an infant or as a young child, um, which is a lot more common than people realize. And um, a lot of times people who have them as children don't, don't remember them at all. But there are specific um, after effects that affect all of them. And they've been documented in, in some of the research. There are books about it. And I, I was sitting in a, in a presentation of some of that research and it suddenly dawned on me, I had one of those when I was a kid and I don't remember it. And, and the reason that I thought that was one of the reasons is because I was always this woo-woo kid, you know? <laughs> and, and I always saw, I always had kind of a strange viewpoint of things that seemed to be a lot different from the people around me. It was as if I could see the bigger picture and um, so I was, I was relatively psychic and I would get impressions of things and I would know stuff that I had no way of knowing. And um, so that was my childhood, you know, people thought I was weird, you know. And uh, <laughs> when I was 12, my, uh, my adoptive mother died and um, the night she died, she was in the hospital dying of cancer and I was at home. Uh, my grandmother was staying with my brother and me and I was asleep or just falling asleep. And my mother appeared at the bottom of my bed, just as, for, you know, total form like you all are, just as fully manifested as you all are. And she wasn't like a wraith or anything. I didn't just see her light body. It was like, I saw her in her body somehow. And, you know, she said goodbye and that everything would be okay. And um, then she left and I got up and walked into the living room. And I said to my grandmother, mommy just died. My grandmother's no, 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 no. And then the phone rang and it was my father calling from the hospital. So this was kind of what my life was like. <laughs> a little woo woo. I started reading metaphysical stuff uh, in the, in the mid seventies. I, um, I went to seances when other, when other girls were sneaking out of, out of, the window in high school to go on dates. I, I was sneaking out of the window to go to seances. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you would think that I really didn't need to have an NDE because, you know, by the by the 80s, I, you know, I had pretty much read all of the all of the information that was out there. And in, in my view, I knew it all. So 
I knew how the universe worked and I knew what was going on with this whole life on earth thing. And um, I hate to say that I, because I was insecure, I used to kind of use it as a club to beat other people up. <laughs> so in 1985, I had a head on collision in a car and I was going straight through an intersection and the other car was coming toward me and looked like he was starting to turn. He, he came over into my lane and I had enough time to register that that was happening, but I don't even think I had time to put my foot on the brake. And the next thing I knew, I didn't feel any impact or anything, but the next thing I knew I was up about 12 or 15 feet above my car, looking down at the top of it. And it was like, huh, <laughs> that's the top of my car. <laughs> it's like, how, how can I see that? And I realized I could see everything like in 360 degrees. And I saw the driver come over of the other car come over and, and uh, look in my car window. And I thought, isn't that nice? He's checking to see if I'm okay. Well, it turns out he turned my light headlights off and I ended up getting a ticket in the emergency room later for driving without my headlights. But so <laughs> I kind of lost interest because based on my reading, I thought there should be a tunnel of light here somewhere. And as soon as I thought that, whoosh, I could hear it. I, I could feel it. I could hear it. And then I could see it as it came in kind of from the right. And it wasn't so much a, of a thing of where I started uh, moving myself through the tunnel. It sort of pulled me like a magnetic force. I was just drawn into the tunnel. Now I was not fighting it. You know, if I could have swum faster, I would have <laughs> because it really felt amazing. And there was something about it, this feeling of, of this, I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was like, this is, this is the way everything is supposed to feel. What is this? Well, of course I realized that what I was feeling was love, unconditional love that we don't really have a lot of on planet earth. And it felt wonderful. And even before I got through the tunnel, it was like, I'm staying. <laughs> this is good. So I got to the end of the tunnel and um, everything was bright light. And uh, over to the side, I, I heard a commotion and there were all these people, you know, 50 or 100 people just standing around, you know, waving. <laughs> and, and as I got closer, I started recognizing all of these people. And of course, the first one I recognized was my adoptive mother who had died when I was 12. And um, I was 35 at the time this happened. So it was many, many years since I had seen her. And, and she looked a lot younger than I ever remembered her. <laughs> and she looked really healthy and really wonderful and really happy. And she was so happy to see me and I was so happy to see her. And um, I had four grandparents were there, uh, a few aunts and uncles, and they were all so happy to see me and I was happy to see them. And the, the fascinating thing to me, besides that, <laughs> was that I was adopted as an infant and I never had seen or known anything about my biological family up to that point. And yet here was this man and I knew him immediately. And I knew that this was my biological father. And I didn't know how I knew it. I just knew it. 
it, like if I looked at Joan right now and said, well, that's Joan, of course that's Joan. You know, <laughs> I know Joan. Well, this is how I knew him. And his parents were there and I knew them. And, and another older gentleman was there and I knew him to be my biological mother's father. And it was like, wow, this is, this is really amazing. How could I know these people? I mean, it's, it's cool enough that all of my dead relatives are here, but, but the fact that these people that I never even met in this, li in this lifetime were there and I knew who they were. And of course they knew who I was. And everybody was so glad to see me and they kept telling me how proud they were of me and how they had been with me through my whole life. And they said, we hope that you could feel our presence because we laughed and, and felt joy with, with you when you had successes and triumphs and, and we were there with our arms around you, you know, when, when you were in despair. And we hope you could, could feel that. And, and it was amazing to think that, that they had been watching over me this whole time. And, and then I started thinking, well, you know, I was a, I was a, <laughs> I was a little hippie girl in the sixties. <laughs> and I'm like, well, were you watching me in the late sixties <laughs> when I was in college? <laughs> and they're like, it was fine. <laughs> you were having a good time and we were happy about that because you had been through a lot of bad stuff. And, and, and I said, but you know, you know, I haven't, I haven't accomplished anything. I haven't even been really good or anything. You know, and they said, we're so proud of you because being on planet Earth and living a life there is really, really hard. And you persevered. You got up every single morning and kept going, no matter what challenges you had, you kept going. And I said, well, I kind of didn't have a choice, <laughs> but it was fascinating to see that I felt like I hadn't really done anything worth, worthy of note. And, and all of my relatives were just so proud of me. So I, I basked in that for a while. And, and uh, the, the first thing that, that came to me was that I was really getting a little tired of it being all white. All, all light. And I thought, you know, as a human, we're used to three dimensions and colors and textures and depth. And none of that is here. And as soon as I thought that, it was as if this hand came up that had been dipped in paints and it just went across like this and the whole scene changed to like a park-like setting. And I saw there were trees and flowers and grass and birds and butterflies and dogs and cats. All the, you know, all of the animals that I, we had had when I was growing up were there and ran past and said hi. And um, there was just such joy there and such love. And, and the grass was alive. And, and the trees were alive and the birds were alive and they talked to me and they had such wisdom and it was astonishing. And, I, and then I realized, I saw this little path and I, and I realized I was supposed to go talk to somebody else, but I didn't know who it was. So I said goodbye to my relatives and I walked down the path and, and enjoyed talking to the, the trees and the flowers and everything as I went by. The flowers were in colors that we have never seen on this planet. And it was just amazing. And so I, came, I, I went through some, some woods and, and I came to this clearing and there was this structure like a gazebo, like a big gazebo. Um, and uh, it had 
it had pillars and a roof, but it didn't have sides. And I could see that there were some beings standing in there. So, so I, I went up there and um, walked in and there were, there were uh, 12 beings of light and they were all about 12 to 15 feet tall. And somehow I knew them too. <laughs> it was like, where have you been? You know, <laughs> and so, you know, they kind of greeted me the same way my relatives had, that they were so happy to see me and they were so, they were so proud of me and everything I had done. And, um, and I said, but I didn't do anything. I haven't accomplished anything. I'm a total failure. <laughs> I mean, I'm 35 years old. I haven't gotten married. I haven't had kids. I don't even have a really good job. It's like, you know, I am just a, a total misfit and, you know, I haven't accomplished anything. And, and so they said, well, let, let us show you some of the things you accomplished. Now, a lot of people have a life review where they actually feel, they feel the emotional and physical impact that they have on everyone around them through their actions. I did not have that. I had a movie. <laughs> but I saw all of these things and I saw some things where I'd sort of go, you know, and, and they'd say, that's fine. But the thing that astonished me was all of these incidents where, you know, I would just smile to the cashier at the grocery store and, and I could see that it kind of made their whole day, just a simple smile. And it was, it was, it was such a revelation that, that these, these little things that we do, these little tiny acts of kindness that we don't even think we're doing are huge. So I had a lot of questions and I asked them all and, and the, the, the answers just flooded into me and I immediately knew the answers. And, and one of them was, I said, look, what the heck was that? <laughs> because being, being in life on earth is, is horrible and, and people are mean and, and there's hardly any love on the planet. And, and, you know, people are still, you know, greedy and nasty and going to war and killing each other and hating anybody who's different. It's horrible. And, you know, what is the point? And, <laughs> And so they said, okay, well, we'll show you. So I, I saw the whole history of humanity. And I said, well, is it ever going to get better? And they showed me what's to come. And I saw like the golden age of humanity where people live in, in unconditional love for each other, where people support each other, where... There's no competition, it's all collaboration and everybody is encouraged to use their creativity and, and find what, what their heart wants them to do and what brings them joy. And I said, okay, so I'm here now and I'm staying. And if I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back when that happens, but I'm not going back to what I just came from because that was nasty. And, and I'm kind of, I'm five, four. Okay. So I'm looking up at these 12 to, <laughs> to 15 foot beings and I'm going, I'm not going back and you can't make me. <laughs> Gotta love the Irish. Uh, so, <laughs> so they're like, yes, dear, it's okay. It's all right. You don't have to go. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Oh, I'm so happy. I could just stay here forever because this is really nice. This, this is the way it's supposed to be. I mean, I literally felt like I had been 
um, you know, like when a wave comes up at the beach up on, uh, up onto the sand and it kind of leaves some some foam and some some water and then the, the wave goes back and you can see little puddles here and there of water that got left on the sand. That's the way I felt. I felt like I had literally, literally been left to dry out in the sand in a hostile environment. And, and being back where I was, was as if the wave had come back and grabbed me and pulled me back into the ocean. And it, it was what I was made of. And it, and, and it was what I was supposed to be. And, and it, felt, it felt perfect. And there was such joy and such bliss that there aren't even, there are no words. There are no words to express it. And I was just so happy that I didn't have to go back. I really was. And it's like, okay, now we can talk about other things, you know, because <laughs> I'm, I'm here and I'm staying. And I suddenly hear, well, but let us show you what you could accomplish if you go back. And the next thing I knew, I woke up in the emergency room. And I started swearing because <laughs> I was not happy. It's like, why am I here? And the nurse comes over and says, you were in a car accident. And I said, no, wh why am I here? Now I'm meaning, why am I back in my body on planet earth? Because this is not right. <laughs> I said I wasn't coming back. They told me I had a choice. And here I am. So the nurse didn't get it. She tried to explain, but she didn't get it. So like most MDEers, ears, I came back and I felt like I had come back for a reason. And for me, I felt like I had made the choice, but I didn't know why. So I must have a mission. <laughs> and I spent the next, you know, 20 years trying to figure out what that mission was, because of course I didn't remember, you know, didn't remember. I remembered a lot of the stuff, but I didn't remember that. The most, to me, the most crucial thing. And along this journey, I realized that I realized, of course, during my talk with the beings that I had been beating people over the head with my metaphysical knowledge. And they said, you know it all, but you haven't taken it from your head to your heart. You're not living it. You're not implementing. You haven't integrated it. So I realized I had to do that. And I also realized I had to change a lot of parts of my personality, which was pretty hard and it took a long time because I was pretty hostile at that point. <laughs> I just had a sheer defensiveness. And in 2005, I picked up this book, <laughs> Heal Yourself, Heal Others, and The Reconnection by Dr. Eric Pearl. And I, all the hair on my, on my body stood up. And I read, uh, and, and I got this, this, uh, I'm sorry, I got the, that confused. I got a flyer in the mail with the cover of Eric's book on it. And there was gonna be, um, there was gonna be a, a class down in Virginia Beach, which oddly enough is where I live now. I lived in DC then. And um, I thought, oh man, I'm gonna have to go to Virginia Beach and, and take this class. And I don't even know what the heck this is. But I did because I knew <laughs> it's like, you know, the universe has ways of making you know. And so I took the class and uh, started doing a practice. And a, a few years later, I saw on the, on the practitioner directory, I looked for other people in my area who were doing it. And, and that's how I found Joan. And um, 
so the rest is kind of history. We, we've both kind of gone around and told people our, our stories and we, we both do reconnective healing. And, and, and one of the things it was, it was fascinating to me because I had, I've worked with other practitioners who do reconnective healing. And once, I guess, once Joan realized that she too had had an NDE, I said, well, doesn't it, doesn't reconnective healing feel like the energy of home? And she said, yeah. And I said, the first time I felt it, it was like, oh my God, this is it. This is the stuff. So that's been, that's been fun. And uh, I mean, as you know, as Jerry Garcia said, what a long, strange trip it's been because it really has. Um, I had my NDE um, 35 years ago. And um it's, I, I can, I think I can say now that after 35 years, I've actually integrated it. <laughs> it takes a long time because there are a lot of, you have to change your, maybe your personality, I did, I did and, and the, situ, the circumstances of your life to fit in with the new perspective that you have after your NDE. And, and that took me a long time. And, you know, maybe some people don't have that problem, but hey, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> but, you know, you know, Ellen, the point uh, that you were saying was these are the frequencies of home. Um, you know, we're trying to tell we're trying to communicate through this real rudimentary uh, facility of speaking words, you know, but when you have an experience, it communicates vast an enormous amount of data, for the lack of a better word, information. And um, what we both realized was that in order to have that access, that access to the field of light and information, that uh, we had found kind of a portal in reconnective healing where it made that access easy, easy for people and I have to say that over my 14 years as a reconnective healing practitioner, I have clients, I don't tell them what to expect. I have clients who, after they have a session, they will tell me things that are similar to a near-death experience, that they've had those experiences on the table, whether it's, I saw this big light and I was magnetized toward it, or all my relatives appeared, or I, I had this piece, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Or they have, you know, they'll have technicolor um, images or they'll come back and say to me, you know, um, I just slip into meditation now. I don't really have to try. It's just, I'm, I'm there immediately. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I, it gave me, I mean, what I eventually went towards was from an engineering very, very left brain to something more a little bit more balanced right brain right and and for me to find a facility where i could uh be of service to people and communicate this the essence of who we are you know we start to resonate with each other and as we resonate with each other we amplify our presence in this dimension and when we find those people, like we're in a, a bit of resonance tonight because we have a shared desire to know more and to access more. So Ellen, would, yeah. would you like to add? Well, I was going to say, I mean, and that's just one of many ways to access the, the energy of home. And, and people ask me all the time, it's like, you know, can you go back to that? You know, can you access it? And, and it's anybody can. And the thing that stops people the most is that they don't believe they can. And um, worthiness, it, really, right? So pardon? Would you say it's like a worthiness issue or? It could be, or, or you know, we're, we're just, we're taught you can't go to heaven until you die, you know, yeah. or until you pay toll. <laughs> yeah, until you pay toll. Right. And, and but the thing is, it's not a there. It's not there. It's here. It's here. And it's, it's everywhere. It's in us. And so 
One thing is you don't have to go out anywhere to find heaven. You just have to go inside and find it there because it's there. There are all these different ways. And it's kind of like once we give ourselves permission to access that, and, and if we ask, the power of asking for help, I can't, even, I can't stress it enough. Because as soon as we ask for help, we get so much help. We have all these beings around us who want to help us, but they can't interfere unless we ask. And as soon as we say, what would it feel like if I could access that energy? If I could reconnect to heaven, if I could help bring heaven to earth, what would that feel like? You're going to be shown. Because you're starting to move and move in that direction. And, and when we do it together, like Ellen and I did so many things together that we just resonated with. It, it brought us to a new level of understanding. And for me, um, a new yeah. level of compassion, honestly. It was it still remains. I I don't know why, but it still remains that we have a journey on this planet. And part of our trajectory is to raise the vibration. And we're doing that. We're doing yeah. that. Now, and I also want to say. Because it's really easy to have people say, oh, I had an NDE and I came back. And <laughs> I loved every day of my life from that moment on. Wrong. I mean, uh, I've heard people say that, but I don't believe it to tell you. It's not truth. true. It's not I true. Was, I was depressed, clinically depressed for at least seven years after my NDE. Because and I was. I, oh, oh good. I was always afraid uh, at that time because I was in the military that I'd be turned in. So I was always in fear of losing my job. You know, if I talked to anybody about it. Right. And, and here I was, I had wanted to stay there. I went to, I went to eternal bliss <laughs> and love and I was all set to stay there. And suddenly I got kind of like thrown back and and, and that, it really made me angry. <laughs> and, and of course, then anger turned, ang anger gets internalized and becomes depression. And I really was depressed for, for about seven years. And it took me a long time to work through that. So a, a lot of people say, oh, I wish I could have an NDE. And it's like, no, you don't. <laughs> because you can achieve the same effects without it. And having an NDE is like throwing your life into the blender with the top off. It's like all the pieces of your life get stuck on the ceiling, you know, and you've got to kind of like reconstruct it and start over. And it's a very, very difficult process. So there's so much information out there now about how you can access all of this stuff without having to die in a car crash or without having to get run over on your bike by a truck or you know. yeah i mean you don't have to have an nde we're so the veil is so thin right now yeah i mean it could be that you find it through what you know reconnect the healing what we do or maybe it's reiki or maybe it's uh you go to a psychic fair and you just you'll know what your entry is and for your next step in your spiritual journey as well. You know, I'm, I'm always open to learning new things. So, and we get led. It's like, once we start paying attention, once we ask the question, what, what should I do next? You know, how can I achieve this? Keep we, your eyes open. Cause it'll show up really it'll fast show up <laughs> and you get led. And, and it becomes, um, I mean, what I've learned is the more I give up control and just hand it over, <laughs> hand it over to my guides and just say, tell me what to do next, because you do it better than I do. My oh. whole life got so much better because I was busy fighting it. I was busy thinking I knew the best way to do things and I was going to do it my way. Well, I have not been highly successful with that. <laughs> 
So I had to get to a point because I'm so strong willed and and controlling. <laughs> I had to get to a point where I completely got pounded into the ground and finally completely surrendered and said, fine, I give up. I have no idea what I'm doing and nothing I do works. And from that moment, that's when the magic happens. <laughs> it was like, why didn't they tell us this sooner? <laughs> I would have surrendered when I was five years old, you know? <laughs> You know, um, I think sometimes we meet ourselves with what, you know, the thing that's perfect for us. I know for me, right before my near-death experiences, even as a child, um, I was, at that time, I wasn't feeling really good about myself. And to have that experience where I could see I was pure love, uh, it sustained me for years. It sustained me through, um, you know, a pretty rocky childhood that I could always go back to that place. Um, the other the other thing, Ellen, you were we, we never talked about the insights that we have. Um, oh. uh, I think my lesson uh, when I was a child and a subsequent uh, experience was uh, about love and self-worth. Self -worth. And um, uh, for me as after, like my after experiences, I was to, like was so totally empathetic when I told her I could hear the thoughts of people in the crowd. After I came back, I could m merge with someone so easily because in my experience, I felt that elated experience of no separation, that there was no separateness between um, us and the earth or any other being. And so I knew, you know, I knew that. So after that, after that, uh, adult experience, I really, sometimes I would lose myself in other people and that's, um, heightened states of empathy, just knowing things. And, um, for me, that's always sort of permeated my life. And I, in some ways was afraid that if I said what I knew, I, you know, might be shunned as how could you know that, you know, and didn't want to be like the, the psychic spy, <laughs> you know, like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there was too much trouble. I mean, I grew up in Mississippi. We got voodoo down there. So you got to, you know. <laughs> well, and, and I guess my, my biggest lesson was has for this whole life has been self love. And I think a lot of people came to this lifetime to learn that or refine it or master it. And I was told that my child was so horrible because I arranged <laughs> I was arranged determined it. to yeah. learn self-love or die trying. And, yeah. and I told them it almost killed me. And they said, almost. <laughs> And I was like, easy for you to say, you're not living a life on earth. I mean, come <laughs> on. And, but, you know, we're taught, we're taught not to love ourselves. We're, in fact, we're taught the opposite. We're taught to loathe ourselves and, and, and doubt, and doubt ourselves and doubt. And because, yeah, because we loathe ourselves, we don't trust ourselves. We doubt ourselves. And, 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 it's really hard to turn that around, but it's really, really important because again, we all have that spark of God, it, you know, inside us or whatever name you want to call it, you know, the, uh, of unconditional love or light or the universe uh, inside us, each of us. And we're all equal in that way. Nobody is better than anybody else because we all we're all little drops of that giant ocean. And, but we're not taught that. We're taught, we're, we're taught by people who wanna control us. <laughs> and, and it takes a long time, but it's a very worthy effort. <laughs> it's a very, very worthy effort. And I, I will say it's not easy, but I think I finally got there. <laughs> so, you know, we have, I think we have about 15 more minutes. Alice, is that right? Yeah, would, um, would you like to just open the mics for questions? Anybody have a question? Donna, can you open or can people unmute themselves? I guess, does everyone know how to unmute themselves? <laughs> I think everybody's pretty savvy with- uh, <laughs> Shireen did have a question. And hi, hi everyone, good, good evening, how are y'all doing? 
Great. I, ho I hope everyone is well. Um, so my question was for Ellen. Mm -hmm. um, you were telling the story of um, meeting your your relatives, and I, I guess my question was, did they appear to you as they appear as as you knew them while they were here? They they actually they they all looked younger. <laughs> Okay. and happier my impression was that you know if 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 you're if if you're there and you're going to manifest yourself to somebody you can pick however you want you know <laughs> so i think they all picked they all picked being in their mid-20s you know <laughs> okay so and of course i had never uh, you know my 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 mother was 40 when when she adopted me so i never saw her that young but uh, she they all looked great that's the that's the biggest part that they all really looked great and all looked so happy all looked so happy okay thank you i, I want to thank you ladies for sharing your story it, it is just such an interesting topic to me thank you very much oh, great. Thank, thank you thank you, for thank you sharing Thank you for coming. Yes. <laughs> no other questions? Um, hey, I have a question. Um, Ellen, well, I have a couple, I have a couple, but Ellen, um, when you saw the, your, your relatives, were they wearing any, like anything? Like, were, did they have like physical clothes? <gasps> oh. Oh, like, let me, can I tell it? I knew there was gonna be somebody. Ash, <laughs> I, I, loved, loved, I was visualizing I it. it. I <laughs> know uh, I love that you asked this question because this is funny. <laughs> I told Joan we're not going to talk about that. But we're not, so we're not going to okay. talk about that. And I thought, I think we are. <laughs> no and Alice, you are just on it. You're right on it. Because I, I just I was visualizing it the whole way. And so Oh like, yeah, yeah. So um I'm gonna tell you a quick story. So Ellen and I, we formed a company together where we went out and we talked about our experiences and held little energy healing fests and um, so one day Ellen was, uh, her, uh, job was to tell about her near death experience at that particular moment. And she was right in the middle of her story and she was headed down the tunnel and she saw her relatives and this woman raised her hand and I, I and I thought, okay, Ellen's in a really, and she was waving. And I said, uh, okay, what's your question? And she said, did your relatives did they have any legs? <laughs> because I don't know if you guys have seen like um, in the, the movie Soul, the Disney movie Soul, have mm -hmm. you seen it? They yeah. have, no one has legs. They're over on the other side, they don't have any legs. <laughs> mm -hmm. She was this this person who asked the questions way ahead of her time. I wonder it's if true. she worked on the movie. It's true. And, and I was completely gobsmacked. I mean, I just... <laughs> It was the first time I ever saw Ellen stop talking. I was like, oh my God. She went, well, in fact, in fact, no, they didn't have any legs. Oh. And so they didn't have any pants. <laughs> oh. They were, was it just face? Well, no, no. I the thing is, it's like you know, my impression at the time was that they looked just as like solid as as you or I do, mm -hmm. and I mean, nothing. It wasn't like nothing looked weird. Like I would say, oh, I saw my relatives, and none of them were dressed. You know, it wasn't, <laughs> you know, it wasn't it's, like that. They it's just often like a, a knowing, like you feel an energetic. Like, yeah. I oh it's my and the feeling is of a whole person it's not just like a visual oh right do they right. have pants or do they have a shirt <laughs> it's, you know, it's like it's it's a total recognition of the yeah, person total recognition yeah. so so I had to because in my in my in my mind you know they were like just all standing there and they were dressed and they you know and so I had when when they asked me that question I had to like kind of go back yeah yeah and, and it makes and you really it, it think was about a, it. it was surprising to me to say well you know i don't think they did have legs because it makes you, know, you look it made you look back at that moment right yeah and yeah. more in a more examining way in a more full way yeah, yeah. because you're not you're not you're not seeing them with your eyes because you yeah. don't have eyes yeah mm -hmm. 
you're but just like you're you're just knowing that they're it's like you're like approaching their their essence and you know them yeah like, you know mm. it's like a oh oh it's you know it's my mom it's you you yeah, know or it's you it's you again <laughs> the recognition I mean, the recognition it's, and it's recognition and if you if you think about it when you're looking at that beautiful other person that is a reflection of you really and the, the the death experience brings you into that communion that we're all one and uh but, yeah just, so we just completely um <laughs> confuse everybody i hope not <laughs> no i i understand i i think yeah, yeah less visual it's more of an experience yeah like, yeah yeah and general. all kind of like beyond even our six senses it's beyond it's right. like a seven you know seven eight nine and ten and in infinity experience that right so like i said when we're trying to communicate this we're trying to communicate the energy of it so, mm -hmm. yeah i see a couple hands up um yes kathy so has a hand ash did you have another question you said you had a couple uh, questions oh uh yeah um well, it was just about um, like the reconnective healing and also the beings. But if other people, you know, have those questions too, that's okay too. No, what was the question about the beings and the reconnective healing? Well, uh, one of them was just um, like, um, what is like reconnective healing? If you can talk more about it. Um, and the other question was like, like reflecting back like who who were those like beings that were saying like for you like to go back or like the 12 people or the 12 beings um mm -hmm. that um ellen saw so i'll tackle the reconnective healing really quickly so we talked about resonance and being in the general vice uh, vicinity of vibration with reconnective healing we're sort, we're sort of moving into the remembrance of who we are as we start to, in a, like in a near-death experience, remember we start to vibrate at a higher rate. And in that remembering is the other person who's the object of our attention. So we're starting to see them as beautiful beings and they start to come along with us, we start to play this beautiful symphony together and we start to raise each other's vibrations. See, the person's not focused on the limitations the person has, they're just focused on being present. So in that presence, in that full presence of a person being viewed, um, we're as facilita facilitators, we're viewing them in their, in, in their perfection. And like Ellen and I mentioned, through near our near death experiences, our, our lesson was worthiness. And when you have a session of reconnective healing, you're moving back to that higher rate of vibration, that higher state. And in that moment, you recognize I am that I am love and I am light. And there is nothing else. You move into that state state of oneness, true oneness. And so we get closer with reconnective healing that way. And um, sometimes we see light beings too, you know, helping us out. And I'd be curious to see what you say, Ellen, about that, about the beings, the higher beings. Who oh, you well, I, you were asking about the beings that I saw or? Well, both of you had mentioned like, you know. Voices. Like, yeah, that's, you know, for Joan that like told you to like, oh, like you, you go back or like push up with your. Yeah, push, yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, and then, sure. yeah. It's a just a yeah. knowingness for for me. It was a knowingness and like that all, all body experience. I didn't primarily ex for hearing it. You know, when I pushed up to push up, and um, you know, I have a knowingness with that. I don't usually see that outside of me. It's sort of an internal thing. But yeah, it was you. Yeah, it's I, I guess a higher vibration of me. A higher frequency of me, yeah. We have we have such a small percentage of who we really are that's actually in our body. I when I came back into my body, I felt like I was Squeeze. an elephant. They were putting an elephant into a Coca Cola can. 
it, mm. it doesn't fit. And so that little part that fits into the Coca-Cola can is there, is here, and the rest of us is, you know, all up here. And um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot more to us than we think. But mine were mine were my uh, they were my my council of guides who who helped me plan this life, and um, it was kind of it was kind of like being called back to the principal's office, really, <laughs> because they, you know it's like I had the universe hit me in the head with a car to get my attention and then sent me to the principal's office, and they kind of said, Ellen, what are you doing? You know. <laughs> <laughs> you need to, you have all this information, all this knowledge, and you have to integrate it. You have to, you have to use it with love, not as, as a club, you know? <laughs> so. more, like, I guess the primary uh, lure back is you have more yet to do is the, and it's uh, clothed in many different ways. Yes. And, I mean, uh, mine was push up, you know, and uh, I would, you know, cause I could see I had more to do as a child. I just knew I had more parts to play. And when I, when, uh, that knowingness came up and I, I don't even know, it's just like it all, I knew it all at once was your mother and your gra grandmother, you still have obligations. You still have things to do with them. You know, how would they feel if you left so abruptly and I was back there. Yeah. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> this is Kathy. Um, I have a question about like in this life with our nighttime dreams. Are they anything? Um, are we connecting with any kind of afterlife when we dream? Or is it all just brain stuff, physical life brain stuff? Because they've had some strange dreams, but I think we all have. I Do you know anything about that? just as from my perspective as an engineer uh, I think we're all in this energetic field the soup and I think when we go to brain time we release uh, when we go to sleep time our brain goes into um, you know a place where this awareness to this physicality is released remember I told you as I came out of my body in the near-death experience I could feel as if my boundary conditions this physical being sort of ebbed away. And then my energy was everywhere. There was no place that I was not. So I sort of went back into the soup. And I think as we go into dream time, a little bit of that happens. We go back into the soup and then we can connect with each other. Ellen, you have a Yeah, I would say that, I mean, my, my, uh... My take on that, at least for me, and I assume it applies to everybody else, is that there's different kinds of dreams. Like sometimes we are just kind of, our minds are going through possibilities, right? Feel, you know, things that challenges and things we're going to do tomorrow and whatever. But then there are also some, I think sometimes we go and visit parallel lives. And, and other times I think we go and I have the impression that I spend a lot of time spent out of my body working with other people on things. And an example of that was I was taking this channel class back in uh, the late eighties. And for a couple of weeks, everybody in the class was exhausted and having these really weird dreams. And I was having these dreams where I was in, in a room with a bunch of people and we were looking over plans and I had no idea what it was about. And, and they said, uh, well, you're, you're all working very hard on something along with light workers around the world. And we said, well, what is it? And they said, we're not, we, we're not gonna tell you right now, but when it happens, you'll know. Well, a week later, the Berlin Wall fell. <laughs> So, so, and then we confirmed, it's like, were we working on that? You know, so I think there's, there's a lot of different things that, that our dreams can be at any given time. Mm -hmm. Especially we are unlimited, we're unlimited. Especially in these times, I know um, I've mentioned to and have heard feedback from other people that they're having dreams within dreams. Like, you know, you'll come 
back way, two dreams out, back to the present, back to this one, and then you're just here, and then you're awake. Um, and uh, they, yeah, you, so you're in a lifetime, in a lifetime, in a lifetime through dreams. It's like a nested loop, you know? Yeah, and the veils are thin. The veils are really thin now, and there's a lot going on, so. Yeah. So, so I those dreams, you, I've been having crazy dreams the last few weeks. <laughs> yeah, the dreams look like like parallel universes. You know, everything's happening simultaneously. Time is a construct. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, and you know, our I think I feel, and I know Ellen, you probably do too, that as we do something, we have the most traction here in physicality. That's where we have yes. it. That's where we're learning our lessons. You could, you know, you can learn a lesson of love here in like an instant. It's always, it's always before us. It's in the blooming flowers. It's in the caress of a lover. Um, that's always here and it makes big traction. But just above that is the idea of it. It's not the experience of it. Just above that's your higher self going, whoa, look at that. But once they're fully in the, this physical experience, that's where the money is that's wow. where the money is so yeah anybody else there's one more question i feel a lot of kind of sadness about all these overdose deaths we've heard about in the last this is in this country number of years um huh. i'm imagining i mean i hope these people are getting compassion when they pass over and everything you know because it's very tragic and anyway I don't know. What do you well, think? <laughs> if I can, I go ahead. Ellen. It's all love over. It's all love. There's only love. So it, there, you know, there's no punishment. There's no God who punishes us. There, you know, it's there's, just we go to love, and and it. I mean, it's always horrible for the people who are left behind, but for the people who who pass they go to love now they they might they can choose not to accept it for a while but eventually they they too will will go to the love but it's it's it is readily available for anybody um and there's no judgment the only quote unquote judgment that might happen is that life review and and the individual soul might say i could have done better in that particular instance but there's no punishment there's just love and compassion for everybody that, that ellen that's so true you know you'll um there are many stories in the near-death community uh by experiencers who said who said they arrived in this place of darkness and it was oppressive and they said the only thing they had to to ask was, is there something else? And, that, and then they would turn to, to the something else, whatever it was. So um, it's awareness and uh, in all cases, you know, there, they, there is a turn there where there, I wonder what, and the question causes that awareness to come in. Right. So in, in, the yeah. in the experience, when I was asking all, and Ellen too, when she was that, wow i had all these things i want to know the power is in the asking of the question and yep. the superpower is in the as you receive the answer see so you have to be listening the question is the catalyst and the awe is the receiver yes that's, that's, that's an perfect. everything huh? that's perfect <laughs> yeah. Does anyone need Elizabeth have any you, questions? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Elizabeth Baba, did uh, I thought you had your hand up? She I did, one. but it okay. was already answered. I just wanted to know more about uh, reconnective healing, but it, it was already answered. Thank you. Okay. All right. And Donna, did you want to uh, tell them how uh, about what happens in March? what will happen in the yeah. new schedule oh yeah. yes right. yes and then um 
and then we do need time for your closing prayer. Yes. Um, but thank you so much, Ellen and Joan. That, that was amazing. Um, we, we love being with you guys and we love yes. your questions. They inspire us to answer in uh, ways we never would have expected. So thank you. Because you bring, you bring that question and within us, you ignite an answer that's new to us too. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. What Alice was referring to is in March, we will begin a new, a new schedule and a, a new structure. Rays of Healing will go back to the, their original foundation of healing. And we will begin meeting the first Saturday of every month. So this Saturday, the 5th. And um, from 12 to 115, and the third Monday of the month during this time, 7:30 to 9, well, 12 to 130, I guess. Um, and it will be on the website. We're still scrambling to get everything ironed out and getting it posted. Um, it will be via Zoom. And we will each each service twice a month will be a healing service. Occasionally we will have a speaker, but it will be primarily a healing service. So um, it's new in a way, but going back to the old ways. So I hope you can join us starting this Saturday at 12 o'clock and then um, the 21st of March. And this will all be posted on the website and on Meetup. And we are also going to get back to posting to Facebook. So you'll have plenty of ways to connect. And thank you, Donna, because Donna's gonna take, uh, has taken charge of posting to Facebook too, which is something that we haven't done. And if anybody knows how to take a screenshot, I would greatly appreciate it because this could be one of the pictures that, that we could post to Facebook. Uh, especially since the two of you are almost in this uh, identical color of, of clothing. Oh. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it just frames it so beautifully. So, uh, Christine, do you know how to do, do a screenshot? I think she does. Yes, I do. I was in the process of going to do that. So I'll do okay. that now and then Fantastic. I'll send it to you. If anybody else wants to come on, she's she's going to take it on because, you know, we've got like uh, 18 people on board. So there's there's quite a few. So uh, but anyway, go go ahead. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Because uh, then if you send that to me, I'll, I'll make sure Donna uh, gets it. I'm, I'm sorry, Emily. Emily has to. We'll post it on the website. Um, okay, so I really want to thank you, ladies. I can't believe how many times I listened to both of you talk. And I said, I said that. 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 I mean, in all the, the, the classes I teach in Course in Miracles and and uh, in, in everything I've studied, the 700 books I've read, you know, it's, it's like, it's just part of who I am, but I haven't had an NDE experience. So I really, but I've read two books on it, uh, but I really, really appreciate you ladies. Really, really do. It was, was absolutely fantastic. And uh, uh, looking forward to having you back and, um, uh, anyway, but what we do right now to close, we will say a prayer, and especially now, there are so many intentions out there that, that need our focus and need our prayers, and collectively, we have great, great power. So um, since uh, Joyce and Elizabeth and Michelle uh, I'm going to go to them first, then I'll come back to the two of you, then I'll go to the bottom row, then I'll go down the side. So uh, everybody very gently close your eyes, take a deep breath in, and exhale. 
dear Mother, Father, God, divine, infinite spirit, source of all that is, we thank you for the presence of these two magnificent teachers. And we thank you for the fact that they both decided to come back. It was a choice and they made it. And that they've enlightened us in only the way that they could. We ask for special healing for the following. We ask, I ask for healing for my son, my daughter, my daughter-in-law, my grandbaby, and the new one on the way, um, my daughter's new husband, the Jones family, Sweeney family, Zarnopas family. I ask for healing for all the people in Ukraine and the terror that they're going through right now. All the people that are stuck in in places of war and conflict or refugee camps, stuck emotionally, mentally, physically. And I ask for special healing for Putin that he receive some measure of light and give up this horrendous quest that he's on, okay? And Joyce. For all my family and friends, and then you, you, Ukraine, whatever, um, crisis, and uh, Baltimore City and Baltimore County and the state of Maryland and all the issues that we have here, and that'll be all for now. Thank you. Elizabeth. Yes, I would like to request prayers for my son, Christopher, my son, Michael, my husband, Daniele, my cats and dogs, all of the animals and all of humanity, and in particular areas in the world afflicted by war, Ukraine, Myanmar, Yemen, and the Tigray region of Ethiopia. We tend to forget about them. I also want to pray for Putin that he may see the light and stop this craziness and that we will find a way to move forward as a humanity full of compassion and love for one another. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Prayers to anybody who is affected by COVID or dealing with depression. Thank you. Joan. For the people who are struggling all over the world, may they find peace within. And for all of those who are affected by the conflicts in the Ukraine and for Putin, certainly mm -hmm. let us offer, offer up that as a golden opportunity for humanity again to turn to the light. Thank you. And Ellen. I wanna offer gratitude. for all of the glimmers of hope that we see, all of the courage that we see in our outer world in the midst of such challenges. And I ask for enlightenment, comfort, aid and healing to anyone who is in pain in any way. And for enlightenment and higher vibrations of love and light to enter the hearts and minds of all humanity. Thank you. And Christine. Thank you, Alice. And thank you both Ellen and Joan for this wonderful presentation. Um, I would like to ask for healing for my dad, for my mom, John, Sam, for Danielle's dad and her stepmom, for Barb, for Alice, um, for Cricket and McKinley and Benny um, and my grandmother and myself. I would also like to add in um, all the crises that are that is going on in the world right now and also healing for Gaia. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, is it Ibi, Ibi C? Hi, it's Ibi. Ibi, Ibi. Um. I'd like to pray for healing in a family rift. And um, I'd like to express and for, and I'd like to pray for us to figure out housing, which I think would help with the poverty. 
and then we can go to education. I'd like to ask for education for just about anybody in the world that needs it, but especially women. And then I'd like to express gratitude for volunteers that are going, that have the courage to go places like Louisiana, Ukraine, etc. That's it. Thank you. And Ash. Oh, and P.S. I'm grateful for this group that I just joined. Thank you. Thank you. Ash. Um, for um, my physical health and um, right now and my, uh, my family and friends um, sending healing to the people that are on earth, the animals that are on earth and our atmosphere. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, and Kathy, thank you. Thank you, I would just like to pray for my physical healing and emotional healing, and I would just like to pray for the souls on my planet Earth. Just send them golden light of healing and hope. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Monty Ann? Hi, I'm here. <laughs> I um, got a little distracted by stuff going on here at the house. So I don't just pray for my family that um, we'll have guidance and the right direction and future decisions. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. And Shireen? Hi, I would like to. Um, Pray for healing for all the people that are affected in, in areas affected by conflict. Um, Ukraine, the people in the Middle East, in Yemen, in, in all the places they're having um, conflict at the moment, especially the, the people of Russia, um, who might not know, the people of Russia as well. Um, I'd also like to express gratitude for my friends, for my family, for the blessings I've received in life and um, blessings for everyone here in this group as well. Thank you. And Wendy. Uh, yes, thank you, Alice. I think everybody has expressed it. I, I also was thinking of the Russian people as well as the Ukrainian people and I just, Thank you very much for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll finish with Donna. I too would like to ask for compassion for the vast majority of the Russian people who are just as horrified as the rest of the world. And of of course, those in Ukraine and anyone experiencing war and fear around the world. Thank you, Donna. Okay. And we thank you for the presence of the angels, the archangels, the ascended masters, the Reiki masters, but most especially Master Jesus. Master Buddha, Master Katumi, Saint Francis, Saint Germain, Saint Gabriel, Saint Raphael, Saint Michael, the Blessed Mother, the Divine Feminine, Mary Magdalene, Moses, Metatron, Melchizedek, Mohammed, and Kuan Yin. We ask that each of us and our intentions all be cleared, centered, aligned, balanced, and grounded, and that we each receive the highest vibrations of light from Archangel Metatron and his healing angels. We also ask for the healing assistance of the Elohim, the creator gods, 
We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Christ and in the name of I am. Amen. Namaste. And I thank you for coming. I thank you for a splendid presentation. Really um, can't, can't thank you enough for it. It was phenomenal. So thank you. All right. And we hope to see you. Okay. Remember now March 5th and March 21st, right? Did I have that right? Yes, at yeah. 7 30. So March 21st, right? Mm -hmm. Fifth at Saturday, 12 noon, mm -hmm. 21st at 7 30. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. We were yes. delighted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yes, you. thank you both so much. You're so thank welcome. You. So, this so this welcome. is so wonderful. You know what I just noticed as in, in, in terms of chakras, it seems you, Joan, are wearing that of the crown, the sure. crown chakra, the color oh. you're wearing. While Ellen is the, the blue, um, which is the one right beneath that, which is the, the third eye chakra. Anyway, no. I, I just I just found that to be interesting. Yeah. Anyway, thank you all. Have a, hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Christine, stay on for just a second. Yep. Okay. So bye everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. We have